Adults, please turn over to the book of Exodus in chapter 30. Exodus 30 and 34. Amen. It's good to see all of you mingling today and praise God, talking to each other. And it's good to see that. All right, Exodus 30, 34. All right, if you're there, say praise the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto thee sweet spices, say sweet spices, the stack tea. And then we have a word that sometimes difficult to pronounce, uh, but I believe it's onica, onica, okay? Sometimes I pronounce it onica, but it's probably onica. So we see, the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto thee sweet spices, stack tea, onica, and galbanum. These sweet spices with pure frankincense of each shall there be a like weight. Thou shalt make it a perfume, say a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together pure and holy. This is the incense, the holy incense. Thou shalt beat some of it very small and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation. Where I will meet with thee, it shall be unto you most holy. And as for the perfume, say perfume, which thou shalt make, you shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Say for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto that to smell thereto shall even be cut off from his people. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. We give you all praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' mighty name, you may be seated today. Thank you for standing. If you look at verse 34 again, you will see a part of the spices, the part of the incense, a term onica, O-N-Y-C-H-A, onica. This is shells. Okay, so these are shells right here. These shells, I believe, these shells were gathered when we took the cross-country team uh, to, to run in a track meet in Virginia. And so these are off of Virginia Beach. So you can see some various shells. Okay, some of them are univalve. Some of them are bivalve, multivalve. Now what is the difference, okay? So you have different shells. You've got a univalve, that means a single shell, um, shellfish, if you will, sort of like maybe a snail, okay? That's a univalve. And then you've got a bivalve. A bivalve is like a clam. So it's got, it's a two-part shell. So you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So that's the difference. So a univalve, one shell, bivalve, two-shell type uh, shellfish called mollusk. Some people call mollusk. I'm not real familiar with that term, but I am familiar with shellfish, okay? So the anaka then is, has come from... It is believed, and I'll give you some research here in just a moment, that it is a part of a shellfish of the Red Sea. So they gathered the, the shells of that univalve. It was actually a univalve, a single shell snail-like creature from the Red Sea. They took it, they broke it up, they pounded it into small particles, and then they burned it. Okay, so it was really very unusual. Now... Some people say that onica is a little bit different. They believe it's from a plant, but we're going to talk about it from the viewpoint that it's shells. So we're going to be teaching you this morning conchology, conchology, which is the study of shellfish. Say conchology. Or we'll just title it God Among the Shells. Okay? Conchology, C-O-N-C-H-O-L-O-G-Y, the study of shells or God Among the Shells. You're going to be amazed at what's in your Bible. Okay, praise the Lord. Amen. So I'm looking forward to it. Hallelujah. Not, I try not to bring something the same old, same old to you, you know, uh, messages all the time. I try to bring you something new from the Word of God because there's so much in the Word of God that we could spend the rest of our lives and we would never get it. We'd never, uh, never see everything that's in it. So we're going to be teaching you God among the shells. Anika is the word that's used in the frankincense or the incense that was used. Holy incense dedicated unto God. 
which speaks of prayer and praise and worship unto our God. All right? Now, let me go through some things here just for the sake of those who really like to study in detail as to what Annika is. Because when you study it, there's various viewpoints. They try to find what it is, try to research it. There's, you know, there's scholars, Jewish scholars like Rashi and other people. They spend a lot of times trying to figure out what these uh, parts of the incense were. But I'm going to go along with what the majority of the viewpoint is on Annika. So I'm going to give you some understanding here. The, uh, what I have here is an Easton's Bible Dictionary. It says that Annika is a univalve in the Red Sea. Okay? So it's a single shell, a shellfish, sort of like a, um, a snail. Now, the word Annika actually means a claw or it means a fingernail. A claw or a fingernail. So it's, it's really interesting. We'll get into this. Then we have the Smith Bible Dictionary. Um, it was the ingredients of the sacred perfume, which was a part of the incense. It was, there were shells of various kinds, Smith says, that went into the making of that, uh, those shells for that incense. Okay, uh, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says it was a part of the sacred incense. It was a shell or a mollusk, shellfish, slash perfume. Wiki, Wikipedia uh, says that the word onica comes from the Hebrew word uh, shekheleth, which means to roar like a lion, or the peeling off by sound. The Syriac term connected to the Hebrew word shalet means a tear, a distillation, or an exuding. The Greek is anika, means fingernail or claw, to sea snail uh, found in the Red Sea. It's in the shape of a claw, and it was used in the incense. T.D. Witt Talmadge, a preacher around the 1800s and 1900s, said, that this particular shellfish fed on spikenard. Spikenard. So it had a beautiful aroma to it. Okay? Because of what it fed upon. So it was basically, it was a translucent shell. It's very beautiful. Looked like a fingernail. Uh, sometimes different colors, but most of the time sort of a pinkish hue in the color. It had, if you look at your fingernails, you will see sort of like some stripes in your fingernails. Okay? It's the same way with that shell. So it's a very translucent, um, iridescent, if you will, beautiful, beautiful, porcelain-like um, material. You know, there's a little bit as to what, was, what it was made of, but it was made of the materials of sort of what it went into a pearl. So it's very beautiful when you looked at it. It was sort of transparent, translucent. As I said, you know, just a beautiful, beautiful shell. And it was found all over the Red Sea. Are you with me here? Okay. So Israel, when they made their way out of Egypt and they made their way to the Red Sea, they would have saw these mollusks or these seashells all over the ground. And we're going to teach you about God among the seashells. When you walk, I don't know if, how many of y'all have walked the, the shorelines of uh, oceans or beaches or whatever it might be. I notice, I know that you've looked down and you've seen all these seashells right. laying on the ground, right? right? Sometimes we fail to understand, at least I, because I'm not really, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I fail to understand that that was actually the home of a sea animal, okay? So, uh, amen, it's interesting because when we see them, we don't see the little animals. We just see the shells laid out everywhere. So when Israel made their way to the Red Sea, they would have seen all of these seashells all over the place. They would have seen the mollusks, the, the shellfish that were there. And actually, in their lives, those little mollusks, those little sea animals, those shellfish, if you will, sustained their life for a while. So there's been a lot of study in relationship uh, to this particular uh, shellfish. How it sustained the life of the nation of Israel. Isn't that interesting? Okay. So we're going to go through this and we're going to teach you today. Number one, God among the seashells. God is going to teach you that he uses little insignificant animals. 
If he cares for little insignificant animals, how much more does he care for you? So the next time you're walking the beaches or the sh uh, shorelines of various places and you look down, you think about how God kept Israel alive. He used little insignificant animals to keep Israel alive. And if he did that for Israel, how much would he do for you? He cares about you that much. And he provides the little insignificant animals to feed Israel to keep them alive as they were making their way uh, through the Red Sea. So God cares about you just like he cares about those little insignificant animals. Okay? Amen. The little shells, as I said, if you look at them, they don't look very important, do they? No. no? But they were the homes of those animals. Now, if God gives a home to a little insignificant sea creature, do you not think that God will provide for you a place to live? Amen. And that little shell that was on that sea creature like this was a coat of arms. So God not only gave that little insignificant animal a home to live in that came from its own body. It didn't, God didn't just drop down that little home on the back of that animal. That animal actually produced its own home. So God cares about each one of us, but he also tells us and shows us God among the seashells that we have a responsibility in our lives to provide homes for ourselves. Now God will help you. God will strengthen you. God will give you what you need, but you have to be diligent and responsible like the seashell. Amen. The sea animals to provide your own home. Hallelujah. So God didn't just drop it down and say there it was. He let them produce the home. Now you think about the wisdom of God in that. If God were to come down and drop down millions of dollars upon us, right? Just pour it down from heaven. We wouldn't have a clue as to how to handle that. We wouldn't know what to do with it at all. So what God does is he blesses us as we live for him. But he makes us responsible for our lives. Because if, we, if we're not responsible, we wouldn't even know what to do with it if God just dropped it down on us. Right? So these little sea creatures, insignificant sea creatures, teach us that God wants you to have a home, but it also teach you the responsibility of the individual. That each one of us have a responsibility, amen, to provide a home for our own selves. God's not just going to give you everything in life. God will bless you, but he holds us responsible in our lives, amen, to have a place to live. So I, I just want to tell you, if God cares about those little insignificant animals, He cares about you. He will not let you go through life without a place to live if you apply yourself to His kingdom and you apply yourself responsibly. You will have a place to live. God will make sure of that. Amen? Secondarily, when you're going through the storms of life, and everybody, every man, I'm going to stand here and tell you this, every man at some point in your life, you will go through a crisis. There is no way that you can go through life without going through a crisis. Every man here, maybe you're in one right now. Every man will go through a crisis in his life at some point. And every woman will go through a crisis in her life at some point. But these little shells teach you that God, if he'll give a coat of arms, a coat of mail to these little creatures for a defense against the waves of the sea, against the storms of life... The Bible is teaching us, God among the seashells, that God will give you what you need in life. When you go through that crisis, man, God's going to give you a defense in that storm. Woman of God, when you go through a crisis in your life, God's going to give you a defense in the midst of that storm. And that's what he promises you, God among the seashells. Hallelujah. Say praise God. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Every one of us at some point will go through a dark time in our life. But God is showing you, God among the seashells, that he cares about where you live. He cares about the storms you go through. He will provide for you in your life. Praise God. I believe that today. And everybody goes through a dark time at some point. We need God in the storms. We need to see God among the seashells in the storms of our life and understand that he provides for us and he gives us a defense in the midst of those crises and those storms that are in our lives. And I believe that. I've seen God do that. Many, many times for the people of God, provide for them, help them through them storms, and that is God. You look at these seashells, these sea creatures, who knows where they lived, how deep 
in the waters. They, divers have gone so deep and they found these little insignificant seashells, sea creatures in the depths of the waters, handling great pressures uh, in their lives. But because they've got that house, because they've got that coat of mail, if you will, they've got that defense, they can handle the pressures that are in the deep. They can handle the storms of the sea that come against them. This teaches us God among the shells. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. When we look at these shells, there are many different colors. If you, if you were to look at it, I mean just a vast array of colors. You've got whites and you've got different colors, reds and blues and all. I don't know if y'all have ever seen coral. But coral, coral is a different study. Than, than what I'm teaching you today, conicology, that I'm teaching you today, conicology, the study of the shells, um, coral is different. It's the study of the ecology of the coral. But if you look at the coral, it really sort of lends itself to the same kind of teaching because the coral, if, if you ever were to study it, really they are the skeletons of creatures, sea creatures. Amen? And they're like little rock-like structures, but they're really, they're skeletons. And they're, but they're alive, and they'll, like we have some in our house, okay? Uh, we have a small sea, uh, seawater tank or saltwater tank, and then that saltwater tank, we've got a few corals. And when you look at them, they, don't look, they look like a rock. But when the water begins to flow and they get happy, those corals open up. And, and then at night, you know, if you turn the lights off, and then you turn a, turn a light that's over the top of them, you will see them glowing in the dark. Wow. And I'm talking about some of the most beautiful, beautiful creatures in the coral. I mean, just vast array of colors, multicolors. We've got some orange in our tank. We've got some green in our tank. We're going to get some more praise because we love corals because we see God among the sea. The Bible says the sea is God, and the Bible is God's, and the Bible says He dwells among the sea, praise God. So when you study these things, and I love it, I really do, I love the corals, I love the seashells, I love the clams, and all of them have their certain ecology, praise the Lord, amen. You know, clams purify the water. They bring purity to the water. They clean the water up. So there's a lot of benefits that the clams serve. But God made a way for them to have a little house and they produce it with their own bodies. Say praise God. Beautiful in color. Beautiful in design. Transparent. Look like porcelain. Some of them look like pearls. And God did all of that. You know what he's saying? He's saying I'm an emotional God. Not in a bad way. He's not an emotional God in a bad way. But he's an emotional God. The Bible said Jesus wept over Jerusalem. The Bible tells us that at times he would sing for joy. He would sing the hymns and he would sing with joy. God is an emotional God. Amen. And that emotion is seen in the colors that he displays in these little insignificant shells. And the songs that they play. I don't know if you've ever done this before. I Probably everybody here has at some point. Has taken a shell and lifted it up to their ears. And you thought, well, maybe when I put this shell to my ears, nothing's going to come out of that shell. You know, I won't hear anything. But when you put that shell to your ears, what do you hear? You hear the song of the sea. You hear bass, you hear treble. You hear the song of the sea, the sound that comes through that shell. See, that's teaching you that you have a God that is emotional. He's a God of vast colors. He's a God of song. He's a God of sound. He doesn't need a soundboard. He doesn't need amps. He said, just give me a, a shell and I'll show you praise. I'll show you my song. And every time you lift up that shell to your ears, you're hearing the song of the sea. God is the master orchestrator. God is the master musician. Hallelujah. He doesn't need amplification. He doesn't need microphones. Just the natural form of that seashell. See, God is a God who is amazing. Listen, my God is not boring. I'm going to tell you something, and I don't say this irreverently. My God is fun. Say praise the Lord. And the Bible said this onica was taken, and it was taken by Moses. These shells were taken by Moses, and they were crushed down. And because they fed on the spikenard, 
this beautiful sweet aroma came out uh, as it was placed on the fire. You could smell the perfume. The Bible calls it a perfume. You could smell it fill the camp. It was a wonderful, wonderful smell, a perfume that went forth. And God is saying when you come to church, you should be emotional as well. But not in a bad way. A lot of people look at worship and they look, look at service to God is a bad thing. It's, you know, it's like an odor. And they come to church, man, they got this look on their face like they've been smelling, you know, something that, that didn't smell good. You know what I'm talking about. But God is showing you that our worship should not be a, a worship that stinks. We shouldn't come to the house of God with bitterness and anger and poison in our soul. Say praise. You see some people, they go to church and, you know, it just they, just, they don't never look happy, do they? They never look happy. They just got this look on their face. And it reminds me of that old donkey. You knew I was going to go there. What donkey are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about the donkey that Grandpa had. Grandpa had a donkey and he had his grandson with him one day. And his grandson looked at the face of that donkey and that donkey was so sad, so sad. And the grandson looked up at his grandpa and said, is that donkey a Christian? <laughs> That's the way a lot of people, when they serve God, they serve, they look like that donkey, the sad face, you know. Are you understanding what I'm saying? But according to the word of God, the Bible said it's perfume. Our worship is a perfume. It, it, it should smell good. When I come to the house of God, I want to bring the right kind of odor. I want to put the perfume, a, a beautiful smell in my incense. Hallelujah. And that incense burner, that incense canister, I don't want to put sulfur in it. But a lot of times people come to church and they bring sulfur with them. They bring bitterness with them. No, God says your worship should be a perfume. It should be a confection after the art of the apothecary. There should be some joy in your service to God. It should smell wonderful. It should be awesome. It should be glorious. It should not be like that. And I know there's a time when we all go through things. But ultimately, your worship to God, he calls it a perfume. He calls it a worship. And so we see the multicolors and we see the feeding of this on the, on the spikenard to make it beautiful and to make it smell good. We see the sound of these shells that speak of our worship and our praise unto God. Let his praise be glorious. When we come, that incense is a picture of your prayer. It's a picture of my worship. It's a picture of my service to God. Let it be brought forth with a sweet aroma. Hallelujah to the Lamb. You think about that woman in the New Testament who brought an alabaster box with spikenard in it. Are you understanding? 300 denarii is what that little box of spikenard came and that's what these shellfish feed upon. And she brought that box, that alabaster box with spikenard. It would cost her a year's wages to buy that. 300 denarii, I think about that. She brought that and she broke that alabaster. It was sealed. She broke the alabaster box. And the spikenard, she anointed Jesus with that oil. Oh, you understand? But I'm going to tell you something. When you anoint Jesus with spikenard, there's no way that that spikenard doesn't get on you. When you come and you worship Him and you praise Him and you bring some joy and you bring some perfume in the house of God, there is no way that that can overflow and touch your life so that when you walk out of His presence, everybody can say, now watch what I'm going to tell you, is she could walk around the corner. And people that were there in that area could say, what is that? Oh, I smell spike nerd. And here she would come, she would walk around the corner and you would smell that beautiful aroma of spikenard upon her. Why was it on her? Because she poured it out on him. And when you pour out your spikenard on Jesus, there's no way that that spikenard can get on you. Hallelujah. 
and our worship and our praise and our prayer unto God. Uh, you may be full of sorrow and pain and agony today uh, in your life, but I'm telling you, when you begin to worship God, He will transform that pain and that bitterness. He will transform that sulfur that's coming out of your life, that pugnant and ca cause you to walk out and you'll smell like a beautiful perfume, a confection. Hallelujah. Give God praise in the house. When I come to the house of God, I may have suffering in my life. But let that suffering be, be transformed in an exuding of praise. Let that pain come forth in worship to my God. And when you do that, guess what? It's going to come back on you. You're going to get the blessing. You're going to get the overflow. People are going to say, you know what? You've been with Jesus. And you've not only been with him, but you have been worshiping him. So our God is an emotional God. He, listen, you don't believe this, but, Jesus, but God dances. God dances. God celebrates. When you come to church, guess what? He's there. And when you're praising, guess what? He's praising. When you're dancing, he's dancing. When you're singing, he's singing. That's the kind of God that we serve. So in every meeting, in every assembly, in every congregation, in every service, every convocation, everything we do, every retreat, let there be a perfume. Let there be a sweet smell that goes up. I don't want to be that donkey that always looks so sad and down. I've got a God that's alive. i got a God that cares. So this morning when you came in here, what did you bring? Whew. What's inside of your, your incense? That little thing they would swing, right? Hallelujah. What's in your incense carrier today? What's going up from you today? Is it sulfur? This smell bad? Oh, when you came in here, did you come in here with worship and praise and thanksgiving and joy? Hallelujah unto God told you about that man Wednesday who had gone through so many things in his life and people looked at him and he was always full of joy and they knew he was going through a lot, a lot in his life but when those people looked at him they saw him he was always full of joy and he was so full of joy that it made them mad Because there's some people that just love to feed on negativity. They love drama. They love, come on somebody, self-pity. They love it. They live for it. They're looking for it. But I want you to know when you got God, you understand the art of the apothecary. You understand the confection of the incense. You understand the parts and pieces that make it a perfume. You will come before God no matter what you are going through in your life. And you will turn that into praise. And you'll turn that into worship. And you'll bring some sweet incense. Not some kind of sulfuric spirit. I hear the Holy Ghost speaking to me right now. You know who brings sulfur smells? The demon world. People who claimed to be in the presence of demonic spirits said when they got in the presence of a demon spirit, it smelled like sulfur. Come on, somebody. You want the devils to get away from you? You want to get those spirits away from you that bring a sulfuric smell? You need to send some praise up unto your God this morning. Give God praise in the house. My worship is to be glorious. He enjoys that kind of aroma. He enjoys that kind of praise. How many of y'all believe that? I don't want to bring a bad odor. I want to bring an awesome, sweet odor. The art of the apothecary, you know. Bring a little bit of distillation, a little bit of roar of the line, a little bit of, a little bit of the peeling off, a sound by peeling off. Let there be a crushing. Let there be a breaking forth. Let it be put on the fire of God's Spirit. And when it's ignited by His fire and His presence, let it go up as a sweet aroma to my God. That's what He wants. You say, Pastor, but if you only knew what I was going through, 
Well, what about that man I told you about in church history? Going through so much in his life. But he was so full of joy. So full of victory. So full of perfume. You know, and he walked around. He, didn't, he must not have walked around with a sulfuric spirit. A demonic spirit. He called it. That, that's the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Ghost speaking to you right now. You got a sulfuric spirit. A spirit that smells like sulfur. You got a demon on your hands. You got to change the atmosphere. When they offered up that incense, that incense hit that fire. That fire was so hot. It had to be hot. Because if that incense hit that fire and it wasn't hot, he would have put the fire out. You got to bring some fire to the house of God. You got to be, you got to be on fire with God. And when you lay that incense upon that fire of your spirit, it'll ignite, it'll blow up and it'll explode in a cloud of perfume. And I want you to know the devil can't handle that. Sulfuric spirits, spirits that bring suffer and bitterness in their life. They can't handle that. They will get out of your life. They'll run down the street trying to get away from you. That's the way the demons operate. I got you a question today. I know at times we go through things, but let our suffering be sanctified. Let us sanctify our suffering unto God. And let, us, let God turn that, that suffering into glory, into perfume. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord, church. When y'all understand what I'm talking about, those spirits. How many of y'all believe, let me ask you this question. When Jesus comes in your life, do you think he comes to oppress you? Do you think he comes to destroy your life? Do you think he comes with that sulfuric smell? No, not my God. Oh, let the, my God owns the sea. My God dwells in the sea. I'm preaching you the God among the shells. Let our praise be glorious. Let the high praises of God be in our lips. These awesome shellfish. When you study the history, not only were they used in the incense, and we'll get back to the incense in a moment. But these shellfish, you would find the dyes of the tabernacle in those shellfish. Amen. In the throat of a shellfish found in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, it was really interesting as you study this, you will find, again, Onica was, and the reason why it smelled so good is because it, it literally fed uh, on the spikenard plant. And so when it was offered to God, you could smell that spikenard through the airs. And it'll get on you. That smoke will get on you, brothers and sisters. But not only that, not only were, was God among the shells in that way, it was God among the shells in the colors of the tabernacle. Because the colors of the tabernacle, the blue color and the purple color, came from the shellfish, came from the throat of the shellfish. And it is said that the way that, uh, that this dye was discovered was a, a dog got one of those shells and broke it up in its mouth. And when it did, it put pu a purple color in its mouth. They said, we can use that as a dye. Right. Amen. Right. Let me tell you something very interesting about this shellfish uh, that, was, that was harvested in the Mediterranean Sea. They would take it. They knew there was a certain particular process to extract that dye from the throat of the shellfish. If it was blue, they would extract the blue. If it was purple, they would extract the, the purple. Amen. Are you understanding what I'm saying? It all came from the shellfish. And that was used in the tabernacle of God. If you study history, you will find out the actual Hebrew word for the blue is, is tekelet. It's T-E-C-H-E-L-E-T, tekelet. Tekelet. It was a particular kind of blue that they used. Sometimes when you read your Bible, you'll see Hebrew words translated like one is translated sapphire. Sapphire was a beautiful blue color. Amen. It is believed that God went when God gave the Ten Commandments. You know, we see that uh, the Ten Commandments, right, that movie? We see, was it Charlton Heston, I think his name was? He comes down with these rock tablets. It wasn't rock. It was sapphire. Beautiful sapphire. You study the history of it, you'll find out what I'm telling you is true. A beautiful sapphire color, beautiful sapphire gem. I'm talking about a gem. I'm not talking about a rock on the side of the road. I'm talking about a gem. 
And those commandments were etched out by the finger of God in Sapphire Gem. And so sometimes the word blue is connected to sapphire, that kind of a color. To helic speaks of a blue that's like the blue of the sky. It's a beautiful, they sort of like Brother Jonathan's color, I think, that he's got on right now. It's a beautiful blue in color. Say praise God. Yeah. And that to helic came from the throat of a shellfish from the Mediterranean Sea. Now watch this. The purple also came from a shellfish. The, the blue speaks of the heavenly Lord, the Lord from heaven in the tabernacle, God among the tabernacle, God among the shellfish. Blue speaks of our heavenly Lord. Purple speaks of royalty. Say royalty. If you study the purple that came from the shellfish, the Hebrew word for that is argamon. And argamon, it was such a rare dye. Purple was a rare dye like the blue, but especially purple. It was such a rare dye that came from the shellfish that emperor's royalty wore the purple. The blue speaks of the Lord from heaven. The purple speaks of his royalty. He's king of kings and lord of lords. But the emperors took that color and they, they used it to make these beautiful purple garments out of it. It was very rare, very expensive. And so the emperors at some point, they started noticing that the common man was wearing the purple, the argaman. And the emperors said, no, we're going to separate the common from the royalty. And literally the emperors made a law against anybody wearing purple. Anybody wearing purple today? Brother Pete's wearing purple today. You could not have, that's sort of, I think that's sort of purple. I don't know, man. Who knows? You know, when your eyes get where mine are, but I think it's sort of purple. But there was a time when you couldn't wear purple. Because the emperors would take you and they would put you to death because they said that's the color of royalty. Do you understand? And so after a while, God says, well, if not everybody can use it, then I'm going to take it away. And for a while, these colors, the Tehillic te and the, the purple, it vanished. Nobody Hallelujah. knew where it was. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Are you understanding, brothers and Praise sisters? God. God said, okay, you, if you want it to be exclusive just for you emperors, then I'm going to take it away from you Hallelujah. altogether. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And so the, the Tehillic the and the, the Argamon, especially when we talk about these things in relation to the tabernacle, if you think about it, how did God do that? Amen. It's 70 A.D. When the, tab, when the temple was burned with fire, Amen. the priestly order that was in charge of the Tehillic, the colors that were in the, the worship of God in the temple, those uh, men that were in charge of that, the father was slain at the time that the temple was destroyed. He was either slain or he was taken captive. And that daddy didn't pass on to his sons the ability to extract the dye from the throat of the shellfish. And so as a result of that, <clears throat> uh, you understanding, for about eight, over 1,800 years, nobody knew how we're to find the tequila, the blue. We're how to even extract it from the shellfish. Until a little over a hundred years ago, a rabbi decided, he said, I'm going to go to the Mediterranean Sea where God is among the shells. And he said, I'm going to go there and I'm going to find that particular uh, shellfish that produces that purple color. Guess what? He found it. It hadn't been available to man since the destruction of the temple of God Almighty. But in your generation... It's been found. In your time, it was found. And not only did he find that a little over 100 years ago, that shellfish, but he discovered how to extract the dye from the throat of the shellfish. That was lost all the way back to the time the temple was destroyed. But a little over 100 years, God said, I'm going to restore the Tehillic. I'm going to restore that beautiful blue color. Come on, somebody give God praise in the house. And so now today Israel, they make garments out of the Tekelech. And they make the, the zitzit at the, the borders of the Talits from the Tehillic. Today it's available. You know what I believe that's? Fulfillment of prophecy. Because the Bible talks about the end times that Jeremiah talks about the tabernacle being found and being restored in the future. Other prophets talk about that. And so if the Mishkan, the tabernacle, is going to be set up again in the future, 
There must be the Tehillic. The, 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 the Kelly. There must be the blue. There must be the purple. And in your generation, brother and sister, in your century, if you will, it has been found again in fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Give God praise in the house. Speaking to you things that are amazing, that are amazing to me. That for 1,800 years or so, that art and even knowing which shellfish it was, had been lost. But God moved upon the heart of a worshiper, a priest, if you will, a servant of God. He was called a rabbi, you know, in their culture. But he said, I'm going to go and find that shellfish. And I'm going to discover that color again. And he did. And he knew how to extract it. That was lost for 1,800 years. But in your time, in your season, God is saying, restore the things of the shellfish. What I'm trying to tell you, what I believe God is saying by that also spiritually is restore the teaching of God among the shells in my church. Let the church know prophetically what that means in the last days. It's a part of your praise. It's a part of your worship. Come on, give God praise. I preach it to a royal priesthood. You are a royal priesthood that's been lost to so many. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people under your God. What that you might show forth the praises of him who brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are living in the last days where God is calling you back to be an understander of God among the shells. Give God praise in the house. And I thank God for that bit of information. I had to go way back to get that. This is an old, old notebook where I studied the tabernacle. And a man by the name of Joseph Good broke down the tabernacle in the light of Jewish history and customs. And that's where that information came from. Hallelujah. Give God praise in the house. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I thank God for His goodness. I thank God for His mercy. I thank God for what He's showing me today. God among His tabernacle. God among His people this morning. Let God arise and let His enemies be scattered before Him. How many of y'all thank God for the truth today? There is another aspect of the teaching of God among the shells. It's the oyster shellfish. <clears throat> the pearl oyster, if you will. The pearl oyster. The pearl oyster is a shellfish. And it's a shellfish that pearls are harvested. Amen. When we look at the word of God, the pro the, I'll call him the prophet. He's Job. Job 28. Job mentions this pearl. Here's what he says. I feel good all over. Now we move into something that speaks of a wounding. A wounding. It's beautiful, praise God. It shows you what God will do with the wounds that are in your life in this world. He will turn them into heavenly pearls. But you've got to sanctify your pain. You've got to sanctify your suffering. And if you will sanctify your pain, then God will turn it into a heavenly pearl. Amen. Give God praise. So look at it. Job 28. Oh, God among the shells. Here's what it says. Job says, and I'm going to look here in verse 12, beginning with verse 12. He says this, but where shall wisdom be found and where is the place of understanding? Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. The depth saith, it is not in me, and the sea saith, it is not with me. It cannot be gotten for gold, neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx. And the onyx is connected to the onica, or the sap uh, there it is, sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it, and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels or fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or, or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is even above that. It's above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it, neither shall it be valued with pure gold. Whence cometh wisdom, and where is the place of understanding? Since it is hid from the eyes of the living, it kept close from the fowls 
of the air. And we ultimately know it comes from God. Wisdom comes from God. But it's more valuable than pearls. It's more valuable than gold. It's more valuable than silver. But Job spoke of the pearls in the Bible. Matthew 13, Jesus spoke of the pearl that comes from the shellfish, the oyster, the pearl oyster. Say praise the Lord, church. God among the What amazing God he is. Give God a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew 13, 44. Let's go there. You better believe it's an awesome word. You better believe it's an awesome word. There's nobody like Jesus. This word is the word of God. We should treat it like the word of God. Jesus gives us seven parables here in Matthew 13. In verse 44, he said, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in the field, which when a man hath found, he hideth it, and for joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth it, and buyeth that field. That particular, that treasure in the field speaks of the nation of Israel. They have an earthly promise. And so what he's saying, this parable, he said, this man found this treasure. He was plowing in a field. He found that treasure. And that treasure was more valuable than the field. In fact, it was more valuable than the world. And so he went and he, he, he sold everything he had to buy that treasure. That's the nation of Israel. That's Jesus going to the cross and saving an earthly people who had an earthly promise. But look at the next parable. The parable of the pearl of great price. He says this again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. That comes from a shellfish. Who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. This parable speaks of Jesus purchasing a Gentile church. This parable speaks of Jesus purchasing you. I don't know anybody here that's Jewish. Not, might be, and I don't know about it. But I want to tell you something. When you speak of the pearl of the great price, Hallelujah. that speaks of the Gentiles from the sea. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You are the pearl of great price that Jesus Amen. purchased. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. It's more valuable than all the rest of the Hallelujah. pearls. Amen. What's he saying? The church. Hallelujah. He said, I'm going to purchase the church Hallelujah. with my own blood. Hallelujah. And that church is going to be made up of Gentiles out of the sea. I'm going to shed my blood and purchase that that pearl of great price. That's the church. That's you Gentile believers. Hallelujah. Amen. He's willing to pay the ultimate price. He's willing to die and shed his blood for that pearl of great price. That's you. Amen. Give God praise in the house. This is just one of many. The, the pearl oyster, the shellfish. His, this one man's name, uh, Linnaeus, he said he counted 2,500 20, 2, species of shellfish. And that's only one of them. But when you think about Jesus going and getting that pearl a great price. Willing to shed his blood on Calvary's cross to purchase the church. Amen. You could also look at it like for your life ap- application wise, what are you willing to pay for him? Right. How valuable is Jesus to you? Hallelujah. If you look at it as a practical application to your life, would you be willing to give everything that you've got for Jesus in your life? Hallelujah. He's the ultimate great yes. pearl, of, pearl of great price. Amen. What would you pay? But he ultimately paid for you. Amen. Right. Amen. Yes. When you study this, uh, this seashell, this, uh, this oyster, pearl oyster, if you will, Amen. you will find out the way that the pearl is made. It's, it's made through the wounding yes. wow. of that shellfish. Wow. Wow. The wound of the shellfish. The rupture, if you will, of the vessel of the water. Wow. Amen. Amen. How does it happen? Well, a grain of sand or some particle gets in, the, in that shellfish. And that shellfish will begin to exude a solution over that pain, over that sand, over that suffering, over that wound, if you will. Because that sand has created a wound in it. 
And so from that wound of that shellfish Amen. called the, oyster, the pearl oyster, Amen. he begins to exude. That's, I believe, where one of the words come from in relation to the onic. Amen. But anyway, we're not going into that direction so much. But we're saying today that there's a shellfish Amen. that when it's wounded, Amen. it covers it over. It exudes, if you will, Amen. Amen. from that pain and that suffering, Amen. Amen. a beautiful substance. <laughs> And that beautiful substance causes a hardness. And it gets larger and larger and larger and larger. And it's harder and harder. And they, listen to me, brother and sister. You know the pearl that comes from the wound of that shellfish is seen in the crowns of kings. Wow. It's so beautiful. Wow. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. What is that saying to you and to me? It is saying, listen, and in order, if you think about it, in order to get that pearl out of that shellfish, you got to kill it. And when you kill it and you open it up, out comes forth water and blood. And the pearl comes out of water and blood out of the death of that shellfish. And so Jesus out of his side came forth water and blood. And when the water and blood flowed from his side, that's when the pearl of great price came forth. That's the church. That's you. That's me. From his pain, from his suffering, from his wounding, the exuding of a beautiful pearl of great price came forth from him. Say hallelujah to the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. If you look in Matthew, Revelation 21, Revelation 21, 21. You ever thought about that beautiful city? Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Do you realize, brothers and sisters, that when you get to that beautiful city, you'll see God among the shells? God's going to tear it all the way into eternity with, you, with us. Hallelujah. Revelation 21 and 21, it says this. So I feel the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, to the Lamb. God is an amazing God. The Bible said the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold as it was transparent glass. But the gates of the city called Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the gates are made out of solid pearl. And what God is showing you that through Jesus' pain and suffering and death, He gives you access into His presence. He gives you access into the holy city of God. It's because He was willing to pay the price for a Gentile church that someday you're going to walk through the gates of that beautiful city. Through His suffering. Now look at your suffering. As I come to a close this morning. Look at your wounds. The wounds that you've experienced in your life. Look at the pain that you've experienced in your life. Amen. The earthly wounds that's causing a rupture in your vessel. That's causing an exuding, if you will, of a substance. That's creating a pearl for heaven. Give God praise in the house. There are times when we live in this world that we're going to have wounds, but yes. those wounds are going to be turned into heavenly pearls. Hallelujah. Yes, yeah. And the Bible said, Brother, I feel in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. The Bible said in Ecclesiastes, uh, no, Lamentations. Amen, amen. Lamentation. He said, wow. Is this nothing to you, to all you who pass by? Wow. See, this is the problem, brothers and wow. sisters. Yes. I'm going to tell you, I can preach the word of God like this, yeah. and to some people it means nothing. Right, right. But is it not any, how, does it not mean something to you today? Is it nothing to all you that pass by? Hallelujah. Jesus hanging on the cross. Is that something or is that nothing to you? Hallelujah. He gave us access through his pain and through his suffering. Bread and water came forth from his side that you might be saved. He's worthy for some praise and perfume and glory. God have mercy on a soul today who passes by and it's nothing. Jesus said this, if you don't confess him before men on this earth, he will not confess you before the Father when you get to heaven. I want to profess him and praise him and pray unto him today in this house. And I'm not preaching for your response from me. I could care less. But he's worthy to be praised. And you can't bring anything to God. There's something wrong with you. God takes the wounds of this world in your life and turns them into heavenly pearls. When I left here Sunday, 
I told you after Brother Timothy got through preaching, amen, when I stood up here, God, the, the Spirit of God brought something into my mind and my spirit. I thought maybe it was for that moment, so I went to my Bible to look for it because I, I, I wanted to be sure about the details of it. <clears throat> And so I opened my Bible. I couldn't find it. I came back up and the Lord said, it's not for tonight. It's for next Sunday. Amen, amen. So I went to the text. I looked at it when I got home. But before I got home, God spoke to me and he said, that message is about wounded warriors. <laughs> the message will be God uses wounded warriors. And I said, that's interesting, God, because the text of scripture you gave me it reminds me of wounded warriors. Wow. And so I went and I studied the text, wounded warriors. So you're going to hear the, the message tonight on wounded warriors, that God, God uses wounded warriors. Amen. Then, brothers and sisters, when I sat down to prepare the message for this morning, I found out that it speaks of wounded warriors. Wow. Amen. Hallelujah. Now only God can do that. Yes. I said Hallelujah. only God can do that. Yes. I didn't put my put it on my calendar and say, okay, I'm going to speak on a wounding from the shellfish on a Sunday morning and I'm going to preach on wounded warriors on a Sunday night. That was the sovereignty of God. His omnipotence, His omniscience, His omnipresence that set it all up. Brothers, when I speak to you, I don't just speak the words of a man. I speak under the action of God's Spirit to you. So God uses the wounds of your life. But it has to be sanctified to Him. Right, the problem is we don't sanctify our wounds. We walk around in self-pity. Yeah. God says sanctify your wounds. Yeah. And if you'll sanctify your wound, I'll turn it into a heavenly oh, pearl. Jesus. Give God praise in the house. Oh, you're good, Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus, you're good, Lord. What an amazing God He is. The wounds of the earth. I'll go through a few of them here. And you know, not all wounds are bad, by the way. Some wounds come from the hand of your God. In this realm called time. And earthly dwelling. When you get to heaven, he's going to dry every tear you ever had. There won't be any tears in heaven. That Annika speaks of the tears, a distillation, a dripping, a dropping. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. When you get to heaven, there will be no more wounds. There will be no tears because God is going to wipe all tears from your eyes. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. And ultimately, that Annika will be lifted up in, in tremendous perfume in the heavenly realms. Hallelujah. But right now, I'm going to say it to you this way, brother. and sisters, all wounds are not bad. I thought about this as I was preparing. Isaiah chapter 1 talks about, he said, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. You've got wounds all over you. Hallelujah. And it's because you're not living for the Lord the way you should, is what right. he was telling the nation of Israel. That's right. And he said, I tried to get your attention by wounding you and wounding you and wounding Hallelujah. you, but you would not get the message. Right. God wants you to understand that sometimes wounding comes from his hand, but it's so that you will turn to him with a perfect yes. praise, Jesus. with a perfume, with a confection, with an incense. But you would agree with me tonight, to this morning as I come to a close. That the wound of conviction is not a bad wound. Because the wound, the wound, the wound of conviction will be translated and in, changed into a heavenly pearl called pardon. So when I come under conviction and I repent of my sins, then God gives me pardon for that. So at the time, conviction is not fun. But when conviction comes, it's like a wound and it's a painful thing. But when I respond I, and I sanctify that before God, God said, I'm going to give you a heavenly pardon right now. Give God praise in the house. And I don't know if you've ever seen this, but I've seen documentaries on the way they harvest pearls. And it's hard to do. It's painful. Those divers, many of those divers, they don't have scuba tanks. They have to hold their breath. And they get off the ships, they dive off the ships into the sea. And they swim deep down, sometimes two to three minutes without any air. To get to the pearls. They'll come back up after, after going down after those pearls. And, and they'll literally faint on the deck of the ship. 
but they got their pearl. Wow. It almost cost them their life, but they got their pearl. Hallelujah. Conviction is going to come to you, brothers and sisters. And at times you're going to feel like collapsing under the weight of that conviction. But when you say, Lord, I'm going to sanctify this pain and this wound, it hurts, God. But I've given it to you. God said, when you get to heaven, I'm going to turn it into a heavenly pearl. Give God praise in the house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. He takes... The wounds of tears. Yeah. And he turns it into the heavenly pearl of comfort. Yeah. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. He takes your cross. Yes, the wounds of your cross. And turns it into a heavenly resurrection. Hallelujah. He takes the, the death of our Savior. And he turned it into heavenly joy and a resurrection life. Hallelujah. He takes your loss. In life, the wounding of your losses. And he turns it into a heavenly pearl of gain. I speak to you as you stand of God among the shells. Hallelujah! Yes, Lord. Hallelujah! Father God, we thank you right now for your presence. It is your desire, Lord, that we have wisdom and understanding of God among the shells, Jesus. Lord, let us not be a people who hear your word and come back the same way. Let us bring the art of the apothecary and let's bring some sweet incense to our God. Let it be placed on the fire of a person's life that's on fire with God. And when it hits it, let it rise up in a beautiful confection. Even our pain and our suffering, Lord, as we yes, sanctify Lord. it to you, yes, Lord. you turn those earthly wounds into heavenly pearls. Yes, Thank you, Lord, for this awesome message today. I believe it's an end time message yes, that you Lord. want us to hear. Church, lift your hands one more time. Hallelujah. And give him praise. Hallelujah. Oh, you got, you got to have more than that. You got to have more than that. If you don't have more than that, you didn't hear what I preached to you this morning. There's a God among pearls. You are a pearl of great price. There's a God who's moving among you right now. He purchased you. He shed his blood for you. Yeah, crush that shell up. Put it on the fire of your life. Let it rise up in a sweet perfume. A praise unto your God. Let the questions of your life be lifted up to his glory and honor. Get rid of those sulfuric spirits. Get rid of those demonic powers that bring sulfur. Get rid of those spirits. Bring the bad odor into your life. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Woo, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah, that spike nerd of worship is getting on you. It's changing your life. It's changing the odor of your life. It's changing the way things smell in your life. But you've got to sanctify it unto your God with praise. Let there be a roar like a lion. Let there be an exuding of praise. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb. Your revelation, brothers and sisters. Job said wisdom is even more valuable than the pearl. Yes, Lord. Your revelation of the things of God determine your response in life. 
And not everybody's created equal. Amen, Pastor. Hallelujah. There are some people that no matter what they go through, no matter what trial, no matter what temptation, no matter what failure, no matter what sin, no matter what struggle, they know what to do. They take it to Jesus. Yes, Lord. They have faith in Him. They believe in Him. Yes, Lord. And they walk in victory and they walk in joy. It's not that their life is perfect, but they know how to get a hold of God when they need God. They know how to get a hold of the blood when they need the blood. They know how to, they know how to have access in the presence of God through a gate of pearl because of what He did for them. And some people, some people just do not understand. They don't understand. They need a revelation of God among the shells. Give the Lord another praise. Lift up praise to the Lord God Almighty. Ooh. Ooh, glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb. Somebody's changing the atmosphere. I smell a sweet aroma of praise. Going, somebody's changing the atmosphere. They're bringing some holy incense unto our God. It is holy unto the Lord God. We praise you, Lord. 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 Oh, listen, don't let anything take your praise. Don't let anything take your worship. Don't let anything take your worship. Nothing, nothing, nothing. 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 You stand and fall in Jesus. When you fail, you get up in Jesus. When you stand tall, you stand tall in Jesus. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Mighty God, let her carry this joy all the way to Zambia. Let her carry this perfume all the way to Zambia. Let her walk among the shells of the sea, mighty God. Lord Jesus, let God arise in that place. In Jesus' name. Woo. Glory to God, glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Praise God, praise God. What a mighty God we serve. <coughs> Thank you, Jesus. I sanctify it to you, Lord, today. I sanctify it to you, Lord, today. I set it apart into you, Lord, today. For a heavenly pearl. It can be painful. It can be painful. But we sanctify it as a heavenly pearl unto God. That wounding. There's something coming out of you right now and exuding out of you. It's coming out of the rupture of your life. It's making a pearl. I know right now when you look at it, it doesn't seem like much. But let it be overlaid and overlaid and overlaid and overlaid. Until you stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you will see the heavenly pearl that he made out of that. I'm not just preaching you words today. I, I'm alive. I'm a human being. I live in this world. I live on this planet. I experience the wounds of this world. But we need to know what to do with them. And we found out today. Let's give God praise in the house. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, thank you for making a pearl. 
from the wounds of our life. And we set them apart unto you, God, in Jesus' name. Feel his presence. Let's continue to praise him. Let's love him. Let's just love him. Let's just love him. However you feel led to worship him. Still small voice, loud voice. Let the song of the sea be heard from your lips. Let the bass, let the treble of the sea be heard from the shells of your life. You will provide, God, a place. You will provide and have provided an armor in this storm. Oh God, we thank you. We worship 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 you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray for this church right now, this congregation. We would understand it. We would walk in greater revelation. There's some things in our life that need to change in our worship. Things that need to change in our approach to you, Father. Because now we see God among the shells. We see, Lord Jesus, your desire to take things as significant, insignificant animal that feeds on spikenard and turn it into a beautiful perfume after the art of the apothecary. Let each one of us come and bring each one of those elements, especially the oinka, the oinka, the crushing of the shells, the placing on the fire that produces a beautiful aroma that transforms and changes the atmosphere of this world. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come tonight, pray for me. God's going to speak to you again. Come with your ear ready to hear ready to respond, ready to move with God because God's got a continuation of what is ended here this morning for you tonight and that is that God uses wounded warriors. One more time, praise the Lord, please. Give Him glory. Mighty King, mighty King, mighty King, mighty King. Mighty King, mighty King, mighty King, mighty King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the next time you're walking the seashore, look down and see God among the shells. And remember this message. Hallelujah. I thought Jeremiah had a big old seashell. You know, the big one, right? And I was looking for it. I couldn't find it. So I don't guess he did. So I got what I had. This has been in my office for a long time. Amen. Doesn't look like much, does it? Looks pretty insignificant. Doesn't look like it's very important, these little creatures of the sea. But to God, they are. Hallelujah. Because God teaches us Hallelujah. from these seashells. Hallelujah. The creatures of the sea. Hallelujah. To those who have an ear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. God bless you. You are dismissed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for being in the house of God.